Ow. Seriously, every part of my body hurts this week. I've been spending so many of my days doing physically demanding things in order to try to prepare for the prairie planting that we're putting in this fall. I've been doing mostly controlled burning on the field. I've been clearing out brush. I've been breaking down fallen trees. My hands hurt, my feet hurt, my arms and legs hurt, and my back hurts. I know, of course, that each pain I feel is a set of electrical signals, more complex perhaps than the electrical signals in a circuit like this one, but not totally different. Fundamentally, electrical signals from injured muscles, like in my fingers and wrists, travel through neural pathways to my brain, which evaluates those signals in light of other contextual information and triggers the feeling that something hurts. Not that it helps to know all of that. If it were simple for me to think my way out of the pain that I'm feeling, the pain wouldn't be doing its job. There are evolutionary reasons why our sensory experiences, including pain, register with such seemingly irrefutable immediacy. It helps us to function as self-protective organisms. I've been thinking about self-protection lately because I've made some decisions, like with the burning of the field, that in retrospect were a bit reckless. It's been a humbling couple of weeks for a lot of reasons. I mean, wow, I'm sure feeling my age. But anyway, I want to talk about how we sense, and how we see, and how we know. Early in this series of videos, I described atoms and molecules as having structure, made up of fundamental quanta, but in a way that we can't easily visualize. I've stated that the fundamental quanta that make up the world are all understood to be point particles, taking up no space at all, even though they combine to create structures that have sizes and parts. Claims like these have a way of prompting questions about how we know. How is it possible to say things like this about bits of matter that are too small to see? Obviously, there are answers to these questions. There are all kinds of devices that physicists build and use to extend our senses, to amplify the tiny ways that quanta influence each other, to record information about what they do. But whenever I hear the question, how can we know about things that are too small to see? I always want to quit back, well, why do you think you know about something if you can see it? How does seeing work anyway? We learn to think about vision and other sensations like pain or touch or taste as ways that we experience the world directly, immediately. But physically, sensing is never direct or immediate. All sensing involves the intervention of an apparatus, even if that apparatus is part of the body. It always takes some time, as a signal from one place travels to another, shaped by everything along the way. We'd love to think that we oversee all of this consciously, but quite a bit of the interpretation and structuring of signals from our senses happens prior to anything that we would register as a conscious experience. Back when I described the double slit experiment, I emphasized the way that it shows that individual quanta in the universe behave in a deeply non-narrative way. Prior to the point of measurement, we cannot tell a clear causal story about what the quanta must have been doing in order to end up where they do in the detector. One reason we're forced into that position is ultimately because of complementarity and quantum uncertainty, the deep randomness that characterizes quantum behavior. But it's also because of the observer effect, the fact that detecting quanta demonstrably changes what they do. The apparatus plays a role in manifesting the reality, which makes it hard to talk about what the reality was beforehand. But really, that part is not so different on macro and micro scales. I would argue that macroscopic sensing, like what we do when we see or taste or hear a sound, generally can be described in wholly narrative terms. It's a series of causes and effects that we can reconstruct after the fact without any weird self-contradictions or appeals to multiverses or anything like that. But even on a macro scale, the apparatus we use to sense plays an active role in perception. Observation is never passive. For example, here's a pair. Rather, here's a picture that you will hopefully recognize as a pair. It's a picture I took with my cell phone camera. I'm able to see the pair, and my camera can record an image of it, because light in the room is reflecting off the pair and thus carries information about its location and properties. The pair is, in a way, projecting information about itself into the whole room through its effect on the light or the electromagnetic field all around it. I know this because I can walk around the room and see the pair from any direction. Any location in the room that has a direct line of sight to the pair is a place I can put my eye or my camera and get an image. My eye or my camera works to detect the imprint that the pair makes on the electromagnetic field in the room. But it's not like images of the pair are somehow floating around the room, just waiting for my eye or camera to passively catch them. I mean, for example, if I stick a white piece of paper next to the pair, it's not like the light reflecting off the pair self-forms a little picture of the pair on the paper. 
light is reflecting off the pair in every direction. But to use that light to make an image requires a particular type of intervention. It's the type of intervention that's performed by a lens, in not truly just a magnifying lens like this one, but a lens that's in an eye or a camera. In that intervention is active, a human viewer or a camera has to pick a focus setting in order to make the image of objects at a certain distance form clearly. The apparatus to make an image of the target in question therefore has to know something, in a way, about the important distance or the important targets of vision. Only with that knowledge can the lens be configured to rearrange light for a suitably constructed image. Now, I can speak about the lens on my phone camera as a thing that was designed, but personally, I don't want to speak about the lens in my eye as a thing that was designed. I don't think that evolution carries intention or purpose. But even if the lens of my eye doesn't carry intention, I do think that it carries some kind of prior collective knowledge or information. My eye was built using DNA, which includes, in a way, coded instructions about the kinds of information that might be useful for an animal of my species. And my eye is different from the eyes of other animals, like Sully, like my cat, or like invertebrates, who may be completely incapable of making images at all. This pillbuck, for example, has light sensors on both sides of its head, but no lenses. The point is that seeing is not a passive act. It's a thing that involves an active intervention by an apparatus that encodes prior knowledge, even as it allows us to get new knowledge. What we learn through sight is always part of a complex web of, of knowing that depends on features coded into our DNA, limitations due to the physical structure of our body parts, and things we've learned empirically and socially about objects and their potential properties. Seeing the pair isn't really knowing much about it without all the rest of that. Like, what do you know about this pair from the picture? Do you know that it's kind of reddish? Well, only if reddish is a thing, which it wouldn't be for the dog or the pill bug. Never mind all the things about the pair that you can't figure out by just looking, like how it tastes. Which, honestly, is kind of mediocre, but whatever. The upshot of all of this is that, personally, I don't think there's that much of a difference between the kinds of sensing we supposedly do directly and the kind of sensing where physicists design detectors for things that aren't on human scale. In this case of a science experiment, because we're actively designing the systems ourselves, we just have a more explicit understanding of the built-in limitations and built-in prior knowledge that the apparatus brings to the task at hand. With the sensing we do bodily, it's hard to account for all of that, and our reasoning and inferences may have more unexamined weaknesses as a result. But fine. If you were the kind of person who was asking, how do we know about the properties of things like this, you probably weren't asking for a rant about human vision. So also fine. Without getting super technical, just think about the fact that there's many situations in life when we infer the properties of things without being able to see them. In the cure, you can obviously tell that I'm holding a magnet, even though you can't see it. Don't worry, this didn't hurt at all aside from the fact that everything hurts. Here, also, Sully can tell that I'm holding a dog treat even though he can't see it. Really, for dogs, smell is more important than vision most of the time anyway. About a month ago, I tried to demonstrate some of the logical inferences that physicists use to understand invisible microscopic structures, only using some tomatoes instead of quanta. It didn't really work that well, kind of like burning the field. But I'm feeling nostalgic about the demo because the tomato plants all died around Halloween. Although they had an afterlife as part of the garment of the dreaded compost monster that terrorized the children on Halloween. But anyway... It's not a great demonstration of the concept, but here's the tomato video. Think about the little red tomatoes as quanta, and we're going to shoot them at a target. In this case, the target is a big red tomato. The big red tomato bounces a bunch of the little tomatoes back. This is not surprising. At all. But what if we couldn't see the big tomato? Could we still infer something about it from the pattern of how the little tomatoes bounced? I mean, here's the big tomato, and here's the pattern that was left over. But if the big tomato was invisible, couldn't we still tell something about it by where the quanta ended up? Well, tomatoes, but you know what I mean. It would be different if the tomatoes ended up here. Then we would know that there hadn't been a big tomato in the way. Maybe it would have been more consistent with some something small, like this little green tomato, which is actually what was in the way. We do this kind of thing all the time with actual quanta to study the structure of things that are too small for us to see. 
we start with our basic experimental setup, where we take a source of something like electrons or photons and send them to a detector that keeps track of where they land. Then we take a tiny collection of the things we want to understand, like atoms or molecules of a material. We isolate them as well as we can. That's what the box symbolizes in the drawing. And then we shoot the electrons or photons through that box. We then see what they do. Do they do something like this? Or something like this? Whatever pattern we see in our detector, it contains information that we can use to infer something about the structure of the target, the invisible thing within the box. So obviously I'm being vague about the details, but this really is exactly the kind of experiment that physicists have done over years and years and years to figure out that atoms have structure, and also to figure out that the quanta within atoms don't seem to have structure and seem to behave exactly as little tiny points. It's really just about shooting things at each other and seeing what pattern emerges in a detector, which actually is exactly the same thing that vision is. I mean, vision is just shooting light at something and then seeing what happens in a detector, like your eyes. We're always using information in a sensor, combined with prior knowledge and interpretation and inference, to try to figure out exactly what's in the metaphorical box. Thank you.